All RISC V instructions are made up of 32 bits. For example, this is an add instruction. It reads values from registers 1 and 2, adds them together, then writes the result back into register 1. But how does the CPU know that this is an add instruction, and how does it know which registers to read and write to? Well, the first seven bits of the instruction are the opcode. This tells the CPU what type of instruction it is, and each type of instruction has a set structure that governs what each bit means. For example, this is an R type, and it's used for register to register operations such as add, subtract, and other arithmetic operations. We also have an I type, and this is for register and immediate addition and subtraction and other operations like that. Uh, an immediate is just like a constant value. We also have an S type. S is for store, storing words and bytes and similar things into memory. B is for branching and specifically for conditional branching. So this would be used when we're compiling something like an if statement, for example. And we have a U type. This is for working with the upper 20 bits of an instruction. And that works in conjunction with our immediate type when we need to operate on a 32 bit constant value. Of course, we can't fit a 32 bit constant value into an instruction uh, because we have a limited number of bits. But we'll have a look at how immediate values work later on. And finally, we have a J type, and this is for unconditionally jumping to other parts of our code. Let's focus on the R type instruction to begin with. All R type instructions will have the same opcode, so we need more information to know exactly which instruction it is. And this comes from the function codes. So we have a 3 bit function code from bits 12 to 14, and a 7 bit function code from bits 25 to 31. Although in the RV32i instruction set that we are implementing, only one of the funct 7 bits will be used. In this example, because all of the funct bits are zeros, this tells us that it's an add. Then we have bits 7 and 11 for the destination register. We have bits 15 to 19 for the first source register, and bits 20 to 24 for the second source register. Because the opcode, source and destination register numbers and function codes always come from the same instruction bits, we can easily decode them directly from the instruction without needing any additional logic. So let's jump over to KeyCAD and decode these. I've already got the top card edge connector and that's our interface up to the instruction ROM module developed in the previous video. It will pass the instruction address through to the ROM and receive the instruction bits in return. To decode the instruction, we can simply create bus lines, and then we can label them with both the decoded bits and the corresponding instruction bits. For example, the seven opcode bits uh, and the seven least significant bits of the instruction can simply be joined together via a seven bit bus, and that will decode the opcode. It will extract the opcode bits out of the instruction. And the other bits can be decoded in the same way. So starting from the least significant to most significant bits of the instruction, we've got the destination register from bits 7 to 11, the func 3 bits from 12 to 14, then the two source register bits from 15 to 24, and finally the func 7 bits. Right, so that was the easy bit, and it gets more complex from here. If we look back to the different instruction formats, it's pretty obvious that before we can decode anything else, we're going to need to figure out which type we're dealing with. So the next bit of logic that we need to build is something that can take an opcode and generate flags to tell us which instruction type we're dealing with. If we look at the instruction set listing for RV32i, we find the list of opcodes. And based on the format of the instruction, we can infer the instruction type. But many instructions share the same opcode. So let's reduce this list down to include only the unique opcodes and have a look at the instruction types. Since all RV32i opcodes have 1, 1 as their least significant two bits, we can ignore these. And now we're ready to find expressions that will tell us what type of instruction we have based on the opcode. In order to do that, I'm going to rearrange this a little. On the left, we have the first three bits of the opcode, across the top and the next two bits. And the grid here has been arranged so that each adjacent square differs in only one bit. And this is called a Carnot map. For example, the top left square is all zeros, and the square below it has a single bit flipped to one. This means that if two adjacent squares have the same value, we can ignore the bit that differs when we write its Boolean expression. 
The blank squares all represent opcodes that we should never get. So to make our decoding logic a bit simpler, we can set these to be the same as one of the adjacent values. Let's start by looking at the S-type instruction. We can see that the three most significant bits of the opcode must be 0, 1, 0. But it doesn't matter what the other two bits are since there's an S corresponding to all possible combinations of bits 3 and 2. So that means that any time the first three bits of the opcode are 0, 1, 0, the instruction type must be an S-type. Now let's focus on U-type. We can see that the first three bits must be either 0, 0, 1 or 0, 1, 1 and that the next two bits must be either 0, 1 or 1, 1. We can also see that the second most significant bit can either be 1 or 0, so this can be ignored, and the second least significant bit can also be 1 or 0, so this can be ignored too. And that gives us our opcode for bits 6, 4 and 2 of 0, 1, 1. And so long as those three bits are 0, 1, 1, we know that we have a U-type. And we can do this for the rest of our types. So for the R-type, three most significant bits must be 0, 1, 1. Notice that in the Carnot map, the outside columns also differ by only one bit, so we can eliminate another bit there, leaving just the least significant bit as 0. For our B-type, there's only one opcode, so we won't be able to simplify this one. We'll just have to check if the opcode is 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. J is pretty straightforward. We need the three most significant bits to be 1, 1, 0, the same as for B, but the next bit has to be a 1, and we can ignore the last bit. Now, I is a bit more complex. We'll need to make a few different groups and all them together. Let's start with the top and bottom rows. For this subset of I, the most significant bit can be either a 0 or a 1, and the bits for the columns can be any combination. And so the first option for I is that the opcode bits 5 and 4 must be 0, 0. Now let's look at the next group. Following the same logic, for this case we need opcode bits 6 and 4 to both be 1s. Next, we'll look at the I in the middle of the grid. This one can be grouped with some that we've already used so that we can simplify it a bit more. And this gives us the most significant bit as 1 and the least significant bits as 0, 1. Finally, we can capture the last I term and again, we'll link it with a group of other I terms. And this gives us bits 5, 3 and 2 as all zeros. Now, I don't want to risk making a mistake with my logic there, so I'm going to test it with a Verilog module again. Uh, similar to what I've done with the other modules in the CPU. I'll simply assign each logic statement to a one-bit output. Since most statements only relate to some of the opcode bits, I can select those with either the colon array selector, or if they're not consecutive bits, I can join multiple bits with curly brackets. Then I can just rely on Verilog to produce the required logic based on the bitwise equality check. Now I just realized that I've been entering all of the numbers incorrectly, so I'll fix that quickly now. For the I type, I can use the same bitwise logic uh, that I've used for the other checks, but I just need to OR the options together since there are multiple options to choose from. And with that, it's ready to test. The test module will check every RV32I opcode and compare the decode modules output to the correct type. And I'll just use a for loop to iterate through each of the opcodes and their corresponding types so that I can see if they line up. Unfortunately, the Icarus Verilog compiler I'm using doesn't support C style array initializations, so I'm going to have to assign the opcodes and types one by one. And one more error. I need to use begin and end, not brackets, for the for loop. Obviously, I've been programming in C a bit too much lately. OK, now we're getting some sensible looking results. I, U, S and R seem to be correct. But OK, it looks like B is not triggering for some reason. All right, here's the culprit. We're checking the full seven bits of the opcode. But remember that we're ignoring the last two significant bits because they were always one. So we need to select only the upper five bits from the opcode. And now it looks like all the types are flagging correctly. That's great. So that gives me enough confidence to go ahead and implement this in KiCad now. For the equality checks, I'll just use AND gates. And to keep things simple, I'll only use two input ANDs. I need the complement of all opcode bits, so I'll add some inverters for that as well. Now, starting with S, we need to check bits 6, 5, and 4, and bits 6 and 4 need to be inverted. 
And because I'm only using two input AND gates, I'll stack a couple of them so that I can check all three bits. U looks pretty similar with bits 6, 4 and 2 with bit 6 inverted, and the rest are much the same. For R, B and J, I need to stack a few extra AND gates, but generally I just need to make sure that the pattern of zeros and ones after the equals matches the pattern of inverted and non-inverted opcode inputs to the AND gates. And finally, we wire up the logic for I, which needs OR gates. And again, I'm just using a series of two input OR gates for this because they're easier to get than the four input variant. Immediate values are always a 32-bit number, and they can be found in all I, S, B, U, and J type instructions. They're used to specify a constant number for arithmetic operations or an address for a branch or a jump instruction. It's divided into different parts depending on the instruction type, so let's highlight things so that we can see which instruction bits make up each part of the immediate. Bit 31 is the sign bit, and we can see that it always comes from the most significant bit of the instruction, bit 31. The next 11 bits of the immediate come from instruction bits 30 to 20 for U-type instructions, but otherwise they are just the sign extension of the most significant bit. And if you can remember how 2's complement works, you can see that the sign extension is just a copy of the most significant bit. And that ensures that the sign stays the same even after we stretch out the immediate values to the full 32 bits. The next 8 bits of the immediate come from instruction bits 19 to 12 for U and J type instructions, uh, but otherwise we'll just sign extend again. Bit 11 of the immediate value has 4 possibilities depending on the instruction type. The next 6 bits come from instruction bits 30 to 25, unless it's a U-type instruction, in which case they're just zeros. The next 4 bits come from either instruction bits 24 to 21 or 11 to 8, depending on the instruction type. And again, the U-type instruction just has zeros here. And finally, the least significant bit has 3 possibilities. To choose which bits to select from the instruction, we can use multiplexers. A multiplexer allows us to select between two inputs, and it will output the selected value. If, for example, we have a select value of 0, then the multiplexer will output the value from its first input. If instead we have a select value of 1, then the multiplexer will output the value from the second input. So we can use this to select between instruction bits 30 to 20 and the sign extension of bit 31. We can use another multiplexer to select between the sign extension and the instruction bits 19 to 12. We'll need to check if we have either a U or a J type instruction this time. And if we do, then we'll select bits 19 to 12, otherwise we'll select bit 31 for all 8 bits. The third multiplexer needs to select between four options, so we'll use a 4 to 1 multiplexer for this. We'll need two bits to select between the four different options, and we can figure out what those two bits should be based on whether it's U or J or B or J. Multiplexer 4 will select between the instruction bits 30 to 25 and 0. The fifth multiplexer will select between the instruction bits 24 to 20 and 11 to 8. But we also need to check if we have a U-type instruction, and if we do, then we need to output zeros. We can do this by using the enable input of the multiplexer. The enable input is active low, so that means if we have a zero on the enable, then the multiplexer will output the selected value. But otherwise, if we have a one on the enable, that will disable the multiplexer and it will output a high impedance. In order to convert that high impedance to a logic zero, we can use a pull-down resistor. And that means that the output will default to zero when the multiplexer is disabled. Finally, the sixth multiplexer will select between the instruction bits 20 and 7, and we'll use the same trick with an enable to default the output to zero. Back to our Verilog code now, I'd like to check if the series of multiplexers have been designed correctly. To do this, we're going to need the full instruction, uh, so I'll add that in here. Then we can extract the opcode from it. We can model each of the multiplexers with a ternary statement. The way this works is the Boolean value before the question mark models the multiplexer's select input, and then the following statements provide the inputs that we can select from. So each statement 
will assign the appropriate value to the relevant part of the immediate. Uh, and so I'd better add the immediate as an output from the decode module. Then it's just a matter of matching the multiplexer's logic to the ternary statements. For the last two, we'll also need to model the enable input, and this can just work with another ternary statement. It outputs high impedance when we want to default it to zero, um, but actually to simulate the pull-down resistors, I think it's easier if I just change these high impedance values to zeros directly. Then it's just a matter of updating the test case to include some immediates. And here I've just got a selection of different instructions, each with varying types, just to try and test out all of the immediate variants. Now this isn't an exhaustive check, but it looks pretty good. I can't see any errors in there, so I'm going to call this a success and move on to finish the PCB. And here it is. I've gone ahead and populated the PCB with all the components. The LEDs for displaying the currently loaded instruction are on the front, and the immediate and type decoding components are all on the back. I'm using the test module to send addresses to the ROM, and I've got a series of instructions in the ROM that test the different types and various immediate formats and values. The layout displays the instruction according to its type so that we can see how it's broken up into the opcode, func codes, registers, and the immediate value. The reconstructed immediate value isn't displayed here, but uh, that will be included on the next module.